Hello once again. Now I'm not in my point point giving state. Oh, I love it. Guys, isn't this weekend fun? Isn't it a fun time? So fun, so fun. Uh, so every year, I really do genuinely look forward to this time of the year. And there's a there's a few reasons why I love love the fall weather that is that is incoming. Like we're we're kind of on the uh, we're, we're we're on the the right before the the intro to fall, getting a little uh, some weather in the 70s up here, just a little bit, and then it dips into the 80s at the high points right now. But uh, is anybody is anyone genuinely excited for the fall weather? Anybody? Yes. Yes, I love it. And uh, you know, with the with the fall weather comes some some leaves that change colors. I don't know if you're aware of this, but man, I'm I'm ready. Uh, there's actually like our our neighborhood uh, is uh, is we love it. We're just like seven minutes from the church, and there's these huge trees as you enter our neighborhood that change color and just all are like real pretty yellow and orange and reds and just so fun. It's like you're you're driving through this awesome little tunnel of trees. It's really 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 pretty, and so I look forward to that every year. Um, around this time, just in a few days, is my birthday, which is really exciting. Which I know a few of you have had birthdays this this weekend. Raise your hand if you had a birthday this weekend. Anybody? Nice. Well done. Some birthdays. We we did give out some points for that. And uh, so I get excited about my birthday. How many of you? It's like a big deal in your house. Like you you have to celebrate your birthday on your day. Does anybody do that? A few of you. Okay. Uh, how many of you have ever gotten out of school for your birthday? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, my family would fall into neither one of those categories, okay? I wasn't getting out of school for nothing, okay? Uh, my birthday is September 11th, one of the like worst days in our nation's history. All these kids are getting pulled out of, out of school, not because of my birthday, okay, but do, do your history. Um, all these kids are getting pulled out of school, and I was, I was left uh, on, on that day in 2001. And so my, my parents were like, nope, not for your birthday and not for this. You're staying put. Uh, but but we celebrated it. We made sure to celebrate it around uh, my birthday, like the weekend before. The weekend after was when we'd have our parties. And but it, but it still is a fun time. It's a big deal, even as uh, as I'm getting older. I haven't forgotten my the how many years old I am. What'd you say? What I want for my birthday? I just I just want your presence, guys. I just want to be here with you for my birthday. Okay. And so uh, yeah, thank you. See, because if I go too far, you guys will be like, oh, we're going to get him that. Please, you don't, you don't have to give me anything. Uh, although I will say that uh, Ansley Kiefer, and maybe I should have given major points for this, she got me a little uh, Gamecock uh, pumpkin for my birthday, a little early birthday present. So uh, felt, felt nice about that. Did not feel uh, well about how the football season opened for us, but that's another story for another time. So uh, fall, my, my birthday um, other things that I enjoy about the fall, you got, it, it's a little more appropriate to have campfires, have, have fires in our fire pit in the backyard, and uh, eat a whole lot of s'mores, which I'm a big fan of s'mores. Oh, man. Hey, we're about to read some Revelation, and I think, uh, I think some of the things that John was seeing in Revelation uh, had to do with s'mores, okay? It's, it's in there somewhere. S'mores are a little gift from heaven, and so enjoy that. Um, also, just enjoy, I do enjoy football. I enjoy football starting up, and so got a little, little picture of my Gamecocks here. There we go. Hey, listen. Hey, I still got a few months to enjoy the victory, okay? And I will enjoy it. I will enjoy it for as long as I can until everything comes crumbling down when you guys destroy us at our house, okay? That means Clemson. And uh, yeah, the season, the season didn't start off like I wanted it to uh, this weekend, but, but that's okay. Football is just still really fun, whether we win or lose. And um, I, I played it when I was in middle school and high school and uh, thought that I could be, you know, the shortest NFL player to ever live and all kinds of things like that, have a, have a kid's line of cleats because, hey, you can wear the same size that Dallas does and all that fun stuff. It, it didn't happen. It didn't turn out that way. Uh, but, I, but I do genuinely love football. And then I love, or I love, uh, I love fall because, because of Epic. Hey, do you know what a bye week is, sir? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Matt, Matt's super sporty, uh, but I love, I love fall. Another thing I love that comes with this time of year is epic, guys. Every year we have this trip, Labor Day weekend, yeah. And, 
and I don't, I don't know how many of you were feeling this. Maybe you, you couldn't go to sleep for different reasons than me. But there's almost like a Christmas uh, Eve kind of feeling when you go. To, did you guys feel that this year? When you go to bed the night before we leave Friday night, you know your your, your family tucks you in and gives you a little kiss on the forehead and uh, just squishes the the blankets underneath you, and you're just a little burrito in there. And uh, not you. <laughs> oh, that happens for me. But we won't get into that. But uh, but really, I I could not go to sleep, and I got up earlier than my alarm, and my alarm uh, was supposed to go off at like five or something, and, and I was awake before that, and I just couldn't go back to sleep, and then even uh, Saturday night into into Sunday yesterday, and a little bit of today, although I am admittedly more tired, there's just this anticipation and excitement, and just so much fun that comes with Epic, and, and not just because of the the silly things like points, but in large part because of the movements of God that we have seen at this place over the years. And guys, let's celebrate one more time what happened last night, just seeing so many of you, seeing so many of you uh, trusting in Jesus and and, uh, and coming back to him, maybe you felt like you've been running for a while and the Lord is just tugging at your heart saying, hey, come, come home. Uh, I still want to be with you. My arms are still open for you. And so many of you uh, did that last night. And really this session in a lot of ways is, is hopefully to send you home well. We're going to keep with the theme of, uh, of the garden, but, but really we want to kind of challenge you and push you and say, hey, uh, ultimately these mountaintop spiritual experiences like we tend to have on a trip like this, whether it was something in session that the Lord uh, uh, was, was pulling at your heart with or it was something that was brought up in small groups or, or a one-on-one conversation between you and a friend or a leader, uh, the things that the Lord's been working out in you, ultimately we kind of have to come down the mountain and we have to live in uh, some of the ups and downs of regular life as we get back home. And yeah, there's a there's kind of a sadness to that, but that's that's the reality that we see over and over in the scriptures as people have experiences with God, they eventually have to uh, take what what they've learned from those experiences and apply them to real life and that's what we get to do as we return home. And so in some ways it's sad, but in other ways it's really exciting. Uh, because we, we can't stay here uh, all the time, and uh, and we actually get to go back home is a lot of times how I have thought about it. And so as we get in today, we're gonna actually going to be in the book of Revelation. We started in the first book of the Bible. We're going to end in the last book of the, of the Bible. Pretty easy to find. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 21. And here, here's the deal why I bring up some of the things that I look forward to is because in, in so many ways, these things I can, I can kind of count on. Like I've got, I got some, uh, some knowledge, some, some surety. Uh, you could call it a secure hope that every year these things are going uh, to come, that football is going to start, that uh, the fall weather is going to come, even though it feels like it keeps getting pushed back further and further and it seems hotter and hotter sometimes. Uh, but we, we can count on Epic being Labor Day weekend and all, all of these things. It's like a secure, sure hope. But even something like that actually isn't all the time because you can remember just a, a few years ago, even something like, no, but these things come every year, it was in jeopardy. And not to go make us replay all the COVID years and all that kind of stuff, but there was a time when we were like, hey, I don't know if we're going to get to do Epic. And we did, but that hope that felt so secure wasn't on as solid of ground anymore. It was pretty shaky for a minute or two. Even football looked a lot different that season. The fall weather still came, but some of the things that we got to enjoy, like being with each other, some, some people were maybe a little more cautious than others, and so maybe we couldn't see some of our same friends. Like, like our world was, was shaken by what happened a few years ago, even if just for a time for many of us. And a lot of the things that, man, I get so excited about when it comes to this season, they weren't as solid anymore. And the truth is, we've, we've got things like that that we all look forward to. And maybe for you, it's something like, like summer break that comes. And, you know, you guys just had that end, maybe fortunately, unfortunately for some of you. But you know, hey, every year I'm going to get out of school at least for a couple of months. And, and I'm going to get to enjoy time without having to, uh, uh, to rack my brain or be, be put to the test by an actual test. Or maybe some of you actually were looking forward to school starting back. And you were genuinely excited to get back with friends and get back with some of your favorite teachers and keep learning about your favorite subjects. And you know that that comes every year or, or Christmas. Or, but, but any of these things can actually be wrecked 
And we saw how shaky a lot of them are even just a few years ago, and I think we all can remember that. But it's not just events that we often put our hope in, but a lot of times it's, it's things like the hope of getting a thing, and man, that can be taken away as far as material things are concerned very quickly. Or maybe it's a friend or a family member or somebody that's just really important in your life. And, man, they've just always been there. Always been there for you to celebrate the victories. Always been there for you to to pour out the hard things. But in a moment, you can lose somebody like that. Whether it be a move or or something else, you you can lose that person that you have been holding on to for so long that you may even have at times put your hope in. My point in saying all of this is not to bring the mood down, but is to say that on this earth there is nothing that is truly secure, nothing that is truly worth putting our full hope into because all of it is on shaky ground. All of it can be wiped away. All of it can be taken away. There's only one place and one person that we can really put our hope in that is solid ground, that is a firm foundation, that is sure and secure for all of eternity, no matter what happens on this earth, no matter what happens in your life, no matter who the people are around you that come and go, no matter the thoughts that are going on in your mind, the things that are going on in your heart, and that's in Jesus. That's in Jesus. And the hope that we have in him of what we're talking about today, that one day these things that Matt was unfolding for us so well last night of heaven and earth being one, heaven and earth being separated, and then heaven and earth coming back together so that we could fully dwell with God. This is where our hope is found, this future hope. A uh, pastor who now has, has actually passed away within the last several month, months, his name is Tim Keller. He says it this way about our hope. He says, our Christian hope is that we are going to live with Christ in a new earth where there is not only no more death, but where life is what it was always meant to be. That one day. My friends, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, if you have met him and found yourself in a place where I cannot help but submit to him, give my life to him, Lord, whatever you say, that's what I want. If it's Christ's blood that covers your sins, if it's his life, death, resurrection that has defeated sin and death, then one day we get to fully live and dwell with him and we get to have our hope there. So we started this weekend by looking at kind of the first few pages of the Bible, and now we're really looking at the last few pages in this book of Revelation, which is uh, written by John, John the the Beloved, John who wrote uh, the Gospel of John, uh, some of the letters of John. And uh, here he is having this vision where at the beginning of Revelation, you kind of get some, uh, some bits about him uh, writing, uh, writing letters. The Lord is giving him letters to write to these seven churches, and you can kind of read about those. We're actually starting to go through the book of Revelation as an entire church of Fellowship Greenville. So if you weren't aware, but you've always been interested in Revelation, maybe you can start following along and pick up uh, with where we are in that series. Charlie's been going through that over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and then the, the bulk of the book, though, is like these visions of the end times and, and visions of uh, what, what is it going to look like when heaven and earth are united and are one. And that's where we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. We're kind of going to jump uh, uh, in a couple passages of Revelation 21 and then bump to uh, Revelation 22. So uh, track with me here. Feel free to read this on your own. It is fascinating. There's a lot of uh, word pictures in here where John just doesn't have the language to put uh, uh, to paper or put into words what he's actually seeing and experiencing, but, but he does his best to kind of make some word pictures, give us, give us some, some uh, metaphors or comparisons in here uh, for us to see. So Revelation 21, uh, verse 1 through 4 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth, uh, or excuse me, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. 
He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Man, doesn't that sound good? It's this reuniting. It's this new heaven, new earth, everything being made right, everything being made whole, everything being completely redeemed. This beautiful picture of what it will one day be like for us to be where heaven and earth are united and we get to dwell. Remember, here's some of our language, which hey, you thought was just kind of uh, in maybe in the uh, in Genesis or maybe you just thought it was uh, in, in the story of Jesus as he's with his people. But here it is at the end of the book as well that he would dwell with his people and he would be their God and they would be his people. And I love verse four. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. Don't we long for that? Long for a time where pain has passed Long for a time where crying has ceased. Long for a time where death is dead. We long for it. And not just physical death, but death in relationships and spiritual death. And any kind of death is no more. We long for that. And we don't just have to long for it. We don't just have to want for it. But we can know that this is what our end holds. This is what God has in store for us when this time comes. And so our hope is sure and secure that this will one day be our reality. Revelation 21, verses 22 to 27 say, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring, it, bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There is no longer a temple. There is no longer a tabernacle because God is living and dwelling fully among us. And remember, shut out of the garden, only one person could enter into the Holy of Holies when it came to the tabernacle. But here, the gates are never shut. The access is full and complete. Can you imagine that? Having full access to God in all of his entirety. Being able to walk with him in a similar way that it seems like Adam and Eve were able to do that. There's, man, just amazing images that come to my mind as I think about this. And then Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5 say, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street uh, through the middle of the street of the city also on either side of the river the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month remember that tree the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations no longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night shall be no more They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever with him. So we get this imagery that's back, like it's a a direct throwback in so many ways to the garden. Guys, the picture that's being painted here is that of a garden city. This theme of the garden continues to go throughout all of Scripture and throughout all of our time together. This is a garden city where it's like, man, there's a ton of people. There's all these nations, which is an incredible contrast to, hey, there was only Adam and Eve in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And now uh, there's all these nations, all these people, people from every nation, tribe, and tongue will be here glorifying God, worshiping him, doing things together, building things together, enjoying life together, enjoying the new heavens and the new earth, being nourished and healed by this tree of life that seems to be spread out all throughout this city. This water of life that is coming from the throne. 
Man, what an incredible picture that the Lord is the light that we need at this time. That, that not, not the sun is lighting up things or the stars or the moon, but, but God is the very light that we will be experiencing in this time. What an incredible, incredible image. And man, if that doesn't do something in your heart or in your soul, if that sense of longing, man, that's what I want. If, if, man, if you are not feeling that right now, I know, I know that, I, that I am. And this is the promise Much like that quote from Tim Keller talked about, this is our hope as Christians that one day we will get to fully dwell with and be with God. Death will be no more. Death will be dead, and we will be fully dwelling with God. And so you're like, well, that's great, but I'm I'm not there. Like, I still have to go through the things that I go through in daily life. I do have to go back to school tomorrow. Thanks for reminding me. And I, do, I don't get to experience that right now. So what, like, what do I do with that? Well, can we, do we just end there? And I, and I think that in some ways, yes, because, hey, no matter the things that you experience today or tomorrow or as you go through life over the next few weeks and months, we can set our sights on that and let that perspective change how we live life today. But I think more than just just saying that, I think we need to hear that from the scriptures because I think in in the meantime, there actually is something for us to do. We're not meant to just wait until that day, although there is some waiting, but not a passive waiting, more of an active waiting of stepping into the things that God has for us here. And so that's how I want to end with challenging us today. Hey, while we are waiting, let's consider how everything in life now matters more And in some way, shape, or form, all of our lives now are meant to glorify God just like they will for all of eternity when this new reality has taken place. Another quote for you by a a Christian author named Philip Yancey (laughs) makes me think of that Yanni and Laurel that Matt's been talking about for so long. Uh, The people of God are not merely to mark time waiting for God to step in and set right all that is wrong, like waiting for this this final time of, of heaven and earth being united. Rather, they are to model the new heaven and new earth, and by doing so, awaken longings in other people for what God has someday, uh, will someday bring to pass. There's meant to be an active waiting in us now. The scriptures sometimes talk about this as we as Christians are meant to be a city on a hill or, or salt and light or be, be witnesses, people who are bringing God glory in everything that we do. And because we are talking about this garden city thought, this garden city that is our, our future hope one day, I thought it might be appropriate to remind us that we actually are all called to be now citizens of heaven. Like this quote from Philip says, to to live now as if we are citizens because we are of the eventual new heavens and new earth. Philippians 3 verse 20 says it this way, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. But this waiting isn't passive. This waiting isn't just sit back, relax, do what you want, and one day you will experience this. But this waiting is actually an invitation to living a life that glorifies him, living a life as a citizen of heaven. One way that maybe we could say this is that the future hope we have in Jesus makes all of life matter more today. The future hope that we have in him, the future hope that we have of his, of his promises for what the future holds, actually makes all of life matter more today. Why? Because, man, in some way, God has chosen to work through us, through his people, so that more people might be brought into this reality. So that more people might be brought to a place where, hey, stop stop hoping in material things. Stop hoping, putting your hope in other people. Stop putting your hope in things that you think might one day happen. Put your hope in the only place that is sure and secure. Put it in Jesus and his promises and this promise of future reality where we'll dwell with him forever. That's why life matters more. So as we leave this morning, I thought we might talk about a few ways that we can actually live as citizens of heaven. Just just four ways. They're going to come up on the screen in just a second. They all start with the letter P. But before we get there, maybe don't, did you already put them up? Okay, sweet. Good job, tag team. Guys, give it up for tag team in the bag one more time. 
there's, there is a piece that, that in some ways uh, we kind of skipped. And some of it is just lack of time. And I, I think Matt did kind of touch on it a little bit last night. But, but in the meantime, before, b- between the time that is Jesus coming to earth, Jesus uh, giving himself as a sacrifice, uh, defeating sin and death, rising again and then ascending, between that and what we're talking about right now, which is uh, revelation and, and the end times and this, this coming together of heaven and earth, between that is the space that we live in right now. And what's crazy to think about is, as we've said many, many times, God continues to want to dwell within his people. And I think some of you already realize this, but God chose us now in this in-between time to be his temple. We don't have a a tabernacle anymore where we make sacrifices. Jesus isn't, isn't physically present with us here on this earth today. But before he left, he promised, I will send a helper I will send one who will comfort you. I will send one who will guide you. I will send the Holy Spirit. Like just to like hover around and do his thing. He has to, to lead and guide us in some ways, but, to, but specifically he talks about coming to live and dwell within us. That we now, we who are the image of God, the Imago Dei, that's what we talked about in, in Genesis 1. God made man in his own image. Man and woman, he created them. Now, the Imago Dei is also the one who God dwells within. And the reason that's such a big deal is because he's the one. Like, some of the things that we're going to talk about, it may sound impossible for you to do on your own. That's good, because I think that it is. But the same same Lord who who empowered Jesus to live the life that he did, the the same Lord that was leading and guiding uh, uh, his his directions and and the words that he used and and the things that he did, that same God now lives and dwells within us so that we can live. When when we talk about living like Jesus, it's not not just like, hey, go try to be a kinder person just for the sake of it, or or, hey, go go be a a servant today uh, and just see what happens. But it's no, hey, remember that the Spirit of God God now lives and dwells within you, and because he does, he now can give you everything you need to live that life, and to love and have compassion and to forgive and to extend mercy and grace, just like Jesus did as he walked this earth some 2,000 years ago. And so this Holy Spirit is the same Spirit who empowers us to live in these four ways today. And each of these four ways, I'm not going to read the specific uh, scripture or, or a couple of verses that I have, but if you want to jot them down and go back to them later, here's four ways that I think the Lord has called us to live as citizens of heaven here on earth and live as, as citizens of this new city, this promised future hope. And, and all of these I want you to see are so counter to the world that we find ourselves in and are so counter to the, to the way of the cities that we as humans have built for ourselves. And maybe for a lot of us in this room, myself included, they're so counter to the way that we often live. So here's the first one of those for us this morning is, is to be people who are prayerful. To be people who are prayerful. You know, I, I think that this is something that we've actually uh, kind of lost sight of. Like we hear, oh, oh yeah, the Spirit lives within me, and yes, I, I said yes to Jesus many times ago, and so now I'm just going to do my best and, and try to make sure that I go to church and, and make sure that I read my Bible. But, but one of the things that seems clear is that Jesus was, was regularly communicating with the Father. And so if we are called to live like Jesus, wouldn't we have to do the same thing? Maybe we would say even more so. We're talking about Jesus, God in the flesh. He was talking with the Father. Even he was like, hey, I, God, I, I want your direction. I, I submit to your will and to your ways. What does that mean for us? And yet, how many times, and myself uh, included, I, I am just as guilty of this as well. How many times is prayer just a thing that's set aside for right before bed or for our meals and not something that's actually a part of our life, that it's something that is, is not ceasing? It's something where as we step into conversations where we just don't have the words and we don't have the wisdom, we're asking, Lord, would you guide my thoughts and would you guide my tongue? That when we actually hear about people who need prayer, we don't just say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. But no, we we may stop right then and there and actually pray for them. Man, am I guilty of that. 
So many times will people come up to me, especially as a pastor. Hey, w- will you pray for me or will you pray for so-and-so in my family? Yes, I'll pray for you. And man, I, I, I just forget it so quickly. But what would happen if we actually started to pray then or we made sure to jot that down in a notepad somewhere and we actually did take those things before God? Something that I've been trying to do over the last year or so, and then I heard one of the Bible guy, one of the Bible project guys talk about this, and I was like, oh, I must be on the, the right track, is in my time with the Lord, I'll, I'll go through and kind of read whatever scripture I'm reading, and I'll, uh, I'll jot down some notes from that passage. And then at the end of that time, I just do this thing. It's real simple. I write down, hey, Where have I seen God answer prayer, and what are my prayers for today? And it keeps track, and I can can look back, and I can just turn the page and say, oh, hey, what was I praying for last week? And, hey, are there any ways that God has actually answered that prayer since then? And I can write down, and I can praise God and thank him for that. But it's really, really simple, but it's been incredibly impactful. In fact, over these last couple weeks, I was just telling my team, uh, a, a friend of mine, actually, it's a I, 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 can, I can shout him out, but it's, it's Bryson Jones. He was looking for a car, and he told me that, and I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start praying for that. And so we started praying, and he had a dollar amount that he wanted to uh, spend on the car. And, um, and how things worked out is his, his dad found somebody who was going to sell the car, started explaining Bryson's story and where he's at in life and what he hopes to do. And uh, they, they decided, okay, we're going to agree to this amount of money. Came back the next day. And the lady said, hey, actually, my aunt that I'm selling the car on behalf prayed to God last night and said that you just need to give the car to him. And so no money. And I'm not saying, yeah, that's an incredible praise report. Uh, it, it's okay to clap. I'm not saying that that's because, I'm, I'm not saying that that's, that's because Dallas prayed that happened. But there seems to be something in our relationship with God where he actually, believe this or not, wants it to be a relationship. And where you talk with him and you go before him uh, um, on behalf of things that you have going on in life and things that other people have. And and you just say, hey, Lord, in the end, here's what I'm asking, but your will be done. And you get to see. It's kind of fun. You get to see what happens. One of your peers who was not able to be with us today texted me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, will you pray for my girlfriend's dad? Um, He's got stage four cancer and he was going in for uh, just what could be a really dangerous, difficult um, difficult surgery. Not sure how the uh, how it's going to come out on the other end. And I was like, man, of course I'll pray for him. And sure enough, uh, jotted it down. And guys, believe me, I am I'm still not great at this. I'm not trying to brag and boast of myself. But but these are are little wins that I've seen over the last year or so. And uh, and and just spending a few moments praying for him. And I texted him later that day and was like, hey man, how's the surgery go? It actually isn't done yet. I'll let you know at the end. Text me back that afternoon. Let me let me know, man. The surgery went way better than the doctors could have ever hoped for. He's back home already. He's recovering. And man, we don't know the end of that story yet, but there's some way where God actually wants to talk with us and actually wants to relate with us and actually, I think, wants to open our eyes to where he's working in the world. And a lot of times he's going to do that through prayer. You know, one of the things that I've seen through prayer is not so much that God has just drastically changed things and done everything that I've asked for, but he's, he's certainly changing my perspective on the world and on other people, and on my relationship with him. And ultimately, if that's all that, that God has for us in prayer, in conversation with him, then man, that is more than worth it. So the first P is prayer. We won't spend near as much time on the other three, but they're all really, really good. The second P is uh, patience, that we would be a patient people. This comes from James uh, 1, verses 2 through 4. And the truth is, man, this is so counter to our culture. Our culture wants everything now. Put it in the microwave. Give me that ramen, right? Like in a minute 30 or whatever your ramen of choice heats up at three minutes for some, a minute 30, I guess, for others. But we want it right now. And we see this shoved in our face over and over and over again. Look who blew up on social media. Look who now has this thing that they've always wanted. Look who has this much money. Look who has this life. Look at all these highlights of these people. Doesn't it look so easy And we're like, man, yeah, I can do that. Some of you, not that there's anything uh, necessarily wrong with this, but but some of you uh, guys especially have gotten into this mode of, man, the stock market and, and, and maybe not crypto so much. But some of you are already thinking about the stock market because you've seen videos online and you think it's just as easy as that and I'm gonna get rich. And man, not to say that none of those guys have actually experienced that or those girls have actually experienced that, but but that's not the place to put our hope and oftentimes that's not the place where 
the reality is that it's actually going to happen as quick as you think. With many things in life, we need patience. And one of those things we need patience for is a relationship with God. Like, we're not all of a sudden going to go from, hey, on Epic, I was a 1, but, like, next week my relationship with God is at a 10 or an 11 or a 13, right? Like, it doesn't tend to happen like that. It tends to happen over time. We grow in relationship with him. So one of the places that we need patience is there. One of the patients that we need patience is with other people, though. And God has called us to be a patient people, not just with us and him, but with one another, with brothers and sisters in Christ and with the world around us. I mean, you guys have met some incredibly impatient people in your life. I know you have. You may actually be one of those impatient people. And it's, it's, it can be really tough to be around that. Like, go, 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 move, move, move. Like, we got to go. Have you, ever, have you ever walked with a fast walker, like, around the mall or something? That's kind of this image I have. Not, not that necessarily if you're a fast walker, you're an impatient person. But, man, that pace of life, like, I just, you know what I'm saying? Like, if everything in life is this and, you know, you're, like, elbowing, get out of my way. Like, guys, that's no way to live. You can't possibly run the race that fast all the time for all time. God's way of life, Jesus' way of life, when we look to the scriptures, seems to be one step at a time, one conversation at a time, one interaction at a time, one moment where you are interrupted at a time. Doesn't seem to be a life of hurry. Doesn't seem to be a life of go, 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 busy, 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 but one of patience. And maybe last part on that, the place we need the most patience is often with ourselves. And we're so hard on ourselves. We expect so much of ourselves. And some of us, it's been ingrained. And, man, there's, there's a good thing to have, have goals and shoot for things and want to grow in things. But I, but I don't think the call is for us to beat ourselves up every time we fail. But to have some grace and have some patience, even with ourselves. Number four of maybe a little bit of what it looks like, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, of to be citizens of heaven here on earth is to be people who are peaceful. People who are peaceful. Guys, this world is wild. This world in so many ways is the exact opposite of a peaceful place. And it's what's going on physically with us, the the pace that we're often set at, but it's it's what's put in front of us. It's the the, the things that we are exposed to on a regular basis on our phones, on our technology. It's all the stuff that we have going on in life when it comes to the extracurriculars in the school. And, and it's, it's so rare for us now to get a, get a time where we can pause and rest and be at peace. I think we need more of that. I think the Lord would, would call us to step into that and not just to find places of peace, but to be people of peace. And not just like, hey, peace sign, right? Like, and I'm real kind and I'm, and I'm real sweet, even though I think that that definitely is part of it at times. But sometimes it means that we are actually people who are peacemakers. That we're willing to step in and in a really uh, unpeaceful or messy situation, we are actually a peaceful presence. And that when there's conflict between friends, that that you might be the person who steps in and Hey, let me, let me hear both of you out. Let's see if we can find some common ground. And, and in some way, shape, or form, you bring peace to that friendship. That some of you, as you get older and you're put into more places of leadership, that the way that you lead wouldn't be a dominating or forced way of leadership, but it would be a way of peace and of love. You guys know what it's like, and some of you, Man, I know that that you even struggle with this in your own home to step into a place of just unrest and unease in an area where that feels oftentimes like the opposite of peace. You know what that's like versus being around somebody who, man, I just feel like I can can let go. I can let loose. I can be myself. And I think a lot of times it's because of that that person's peaceful presence. And many times that's something that the, the spirit wants to well up within us. And then this final thing that ends with P. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are things that you can read about uh, as you study the scripture and see for yourselves what it looks like for us to be a citizen of heaven here on earth. But the last one would be pure. That we would be 
a people who are pure. That we live in purity. And there's so many things that that means, but here's what I think it means at a base level, is that we would be people who set our eyes on the things that are above. And that we let those things shape us and mold us and become the the words that we use, that our words would be seasoned with, with purity, that, that the thoughts we have might be pure ones, that the things that we spend our time on might be things that are healthy and good. And, man, again, because if we contrast this with the world, oftentimes the, the music and the, the shows that we watch and the, the movies and the social media things we indulge and the conversations that we have with people, it's, if we're being honest, a lot of times it's the opposite of pure things. And let me challenge you with this on this idea of purity is that those things you're being exposed to are shaping your mind. In a sense, they are shaping your heart. They are are discipling you. Some of you are being far more discipled by your screens and things that are digital than you are by following Jesus. And that's not like, hey, to make you feel guilty, but it's to help you hopefully see the serious weight of the things that we expose ourselves to, the things that we put ourselves in front of, the things that we set our minds towards will be the things that shape how we live and how we interact with others and how we think about ourselves. So let's set our minds on things that are above. That are above. Let's set our minds on things that are pure. This is just a piece of what it means and looks like to be a citizen of heaven who is living out life here on earth. And man, as I read through these, I I am more than challenged by these things from Scripture about how the Lord has called us to live. But man, I'm, I'm so thankful that we don't have to do this on our own, that the Holy Spirit is with us, living and dwelling within us, one step at a time with him, following his ways, and that as we do, he's gonna grow us in this. Have patience with yourself. Be in constant prayer with him. Set your mind on things that are pure and holy. And over time, he's going to change you to look more and more like a citizen of heaven, like a a city on a hill. That you'll be living a life that is seasoned with, with salt, salt and light in a dark world. That your life might reflect and glorify him more and more every day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the secure and sure hope that we have in you. That when there is nothing else that we can place our hopes and our dreams and our lives in, God, you are the one who is firm. You are the one who is sturdy and stable. And so, Lord, I pray that as we leave here, that we wouldn't be quick to just turn back to our old ways and old things, but that you and your Holy Spirit would help us to set our minds on the things above that we would be shaped by you and this future hope that we have in you. And Lord, that over time, that we might see you mold and shape our lives, that we would be a people of FG students, middle and high schoolers, wherever we go from here, that we would be a people who reflect you well to the world, who glorify you in all that we do and live on earth as citizens of heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.